Good evening. I'm Steve Johnson. I'm the director of the Seawolf Debate Program at UAA, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this evening's debate. Sometimes you get really lucky when you pick a topic for a debate, though whether the perspective I'm about to offer you counts as luck is itself debatable. When Rick Goodfellow and I started talking about this motion nearly a year ago, oil prices were around $105 a barrel. Little did we know that when the debate date for this debate rolled around, oil prices would have fallen dramatically, and the question posed by tonight's motion would be more than merely academic. But then again, low oil prices are not the only thing troubling support for the institutions, like classical music, that celebrate our collective humanity. We're fortunate to live in a community with a university that supports programs like ours. Others aren't so fortunate like people who live in Louisiana, where governor and likely presidential candidate, Bobby Jindal, has just proposed an 82% cut to, to funding for higher education. Or at a university just north of here, where programs that inspire inquiry and critical thought are on the chopping block. Now to be fair, UAF's decision to cut philosophy, their philosophy program was motivated by an extremely low student enrollment, but that too is cause for concern. Clearly, it's not just classical music that's in decline. How is it that we got here to a place where we seem willing to abandon the search for truth and beauty? It's somewhat paradoxical because there are still those who see the value in pursuits such as this as self-evident, like all of you. You paid to come to a debate tonight. <laughs> and not just a debate, a debate about classical music. Now, you either did so because you're a fan of classical music, or you're a fan of debating, or you're a fan of me. <laughs> I was going to say I'm not betting heavily on the third, but maybe I should have. The question is, how is it that a society that produces an audience willing to think deeply together can simultaneously dismantle public support for our quest to explore and celebrate the human condition. And more to the point, are we content to conceive of philosophy as a collection of books on a shelf, and as classical music as a number of MP3s encoded on a hard drive? Or are those things, and the manifold other studies of arts and humanities, to be lived and performed and experienced collectively? But there are other questions. Is it appropriate that those who appreciate the arts bear the burden of supporting them. I mean, after all, I don't buy tickets to NASCAR events, and I don't want to subsidize those who do buy tickets to NASCAR events. <laughs> but is classical music like NASCAR racing, or is it something entirely different? And all of these questions address the larger overriding issue. What kind of society do we want to build, and how shall we build it? Hopefully, the discussion tonight will help to answer some of those questions. <coughs> The format or the motion for tonight's debate is this house believes that classical music deserves no support beyond that which the market will provide. We're going to use a format of debating to interrogate this motion that is based roughly on the type of debating in which Oxford and UAA compete in tournaments around the world. It's known as the British parliamentary form of debating. As you can probably guess, it came from Britain. And there are several hallmarks of this style of debating that will help you understand what's going to happen tonight. First, we're going to open with four eight-minute constructive speeches, two from the proposition and two from the opposition. We'll begin with a speech from the proposition and alternate back and forth between the proposition and opposition until each team has had an opportunity to make their case for or against the motion in those eight-minute speeches. During those speeches, you're going to hear a series of bells. Those bells will sound like this. They will be more promptly timed during the debater's speeches, no doubt. Those bells indicate that points of information can be offered. A point of information is a brief interjection from the opposing side. So if the primary speaker holding the floor, for example, the first speaker from Oxford, um, is, is giving his or her speech, uh, it is entirely appropriate for somebody from the other team to stand and ask for the opportunity to ask a point of information. Those points of information are entirely controlled by the primary speaker. That means that Oxford, while giving that primary speech, can decide to either accept or reject that point of information at their discretion. They may do so by simply saying, not at this time, or by waving their opponent down. 
It's not them being rude. They're expected to manage their time appropriately so that the audience and the debaters have a chance to hear the full breadth of the arguments being asked. If they pr provide the opportunity to their opposition to ask that point of information, the questioner gets 10 to 15 seconds to make a brief argument or to pose that question, and the primary speaker then regains control of the floor and is expected to incorporate his or her answer into the remaining part of their speech. Those points of information happen only during the first four speeches. Once those first four speeches are done, we're going to take a break and hear from our guest judges. We're gonna allow them an opportunity to ask questions of the debaters, to interact with them, to probe some of the arguments that they've made, to question some of the assumptions on which those arguments are based, and generally to get some conversation going about what classical music is and how we believe it should be supported. Once that period of the debate is over, we'll provide each team one five-minute rebuttal speech, beginning with the opposition, so that the opposition has a chance then to close and the proposition has the last word on the motion. Once all of that's done, we'll return back to our judges and have them articulate their decision, either for the proposition or the opposition, and explain how they arrived at that decision. A couple of other notes will help you enjoy tonight's debate. Keep in mind that academic debating is about interrogating the motion fully. The debaters that are going to make the arguments may or may not believe the positions that they're taking personally. They may be convicted in what they're saying, and they may present those arguments forcefully, but you may find, if you interact with them after the debate, that they have a personal conviction that's different from the arguments they're making. That's part of what the tradition of academic debating is. It's about exploring those ideas and doing so in a, in a space that is safe and allows them to do so. The other part of debating, or at least British parliamentary debating as we practice it, that is a hallmark, is that we love audience interaction. So if there's a time during the debate that you feel a good argument is being made or some point is being offered that you would wish to reinforce for the debaters, you should let them know. The traditional way of doing that is to pound on something and say, here, here. If you've ever seen, for example, question time during the, uh, the uh, question time with the Prime Minister from the House of Commons, you know that that House is a pretty raucous debating chamber and that the members are not at all shy about letting the Speaker know whether or not they support him. The way that we do it here is the same way, to pound on something and say, here, here. It's a good opportunity to practice that now so you don't feel uncomfortable during the debate. Go ahead and pound on something and say, here, here. That's good. Oh, it's a great level of energy in this house. I like that. That's fantastic. Feel free to let the debaters know that you support what it is they're saying to reinforce those points that really resonate with you because they'll appreciate it. Let's now meet our debaters. Representing Oxford and arguing in favor of the motion, are Matt Handley and Karen Hunt. <laughs> Matt and Karen hail from one of the most influential and storied institutions in academic debating, the Oxford Union. Each of them have contributed their own chapters to that story. Matt was twice a semifinalist at the World University's Debating Championship and twice a finalist at the European University's Debating Championship. Karen represented Oxford when she won the English Mace, Britain's National Debating Championship. No doubt their performance here tonight will contribute even more to the legend that is the Oxford Union. <laughs> and while they may lack the accents of their opponents, the home team is also comprised of two accomplished debaters, Representing UAA and arguing against tonight's motion are Matthew Ostrander and Jonathan Taylor. Both of these guys have accumulated significant individual accomplishments. Last year, for example, Matthew won the International Debate Education Association's Global Debate and Public Policy Challenge in Budapest. In 2014, Jonathan was named the top novice speaker in the United States but their proficiency is best represented by what they've accomplished as a team. Twice, in 2014 and most recently, at the 2015 U.S. University's Debating Championships hosted here in Anchorage, Matthew and Jonathan advanced to the quarterfinal round of our national championship tournament. This year, they were the only team representing a public university in that quarterfinal round. And I should also note that they make a heck of a campaign ticket as well. They were just recently elected president and vice president of the Union of Students at UAA. Congratulations on that. <laughs> the 
But for all their accomplishments, neither of these teams has particular expertise in classical music or the forces that drive the music industry. For that, we need some help. Let's meet our guest judges for the evening. First, please help me welcome Zul Bailey. Zul is a very busy cellist with a demanding international career who has become an adopted Alaskan ever since he took over the artistic leadership of the Sitka Summer Music Festival. To be, to be here tonight, he sandwiched the Alaska flight between a concert in El Paso and one this weekend in Washington, D.C. So Zul, I actually wanted to ask you a question. Could you grab that mic for me? El Paso versus Washington, D.C. Who has the better audience? We've got a Washington Post critic here. I can't, I don't know how to say. <laughs> so, you know, a debate coach would call that pandering. <laughs> Our second guest judge for the evening is Hobo Jim Varsos. Hobo Jim has composed and sung his way into becoming an Alaskan icon, beloved all over the state for his concerts. He has also written songs recorded by the likes of George Jones, Randy Travis, T. Graham Brown, Leroy Parnell, Michael Johnson, and the amazing Rhythm Aces. Tomorrow, he and his wife will celebrate their 35th wedding anniversary. And I've been wondering, Hobo Jim, how many songs have you composed for your wife over the years? Uh, my wife gets a song every anniversary, so she has 35 songs. <laughs> Rounding out our panel of judges this evening is Washington Post music critic Anne Majette. Anne is the classical music critic at the Washington Post, which she joined in 2008. She says her role as a critic makes her the black sheep of the family. <laughs> she blogs at the Classical Beat, which she really thinks you should be reading. And she's also the mother of four-year-old Raphael, who has come along on this trip to Alaska, as has her husband, Greg Sando. Welcome, Anne. And I was wondering, Raphael, I'm certain, is learning music. Which instrument is he starting with? We have an electric keyboard and a plastic trumpet that we call the sousaphone, as in Dr. Seuss. <laughs> <laughs> he seems much better on the latter than on the former. Outstanding. Well, those judges are certainly going to weigh in with their expertise and their opinion, but they're not the only judges that are going to be present in the room tonight. All of you are going to have the opportunity to voice your opinion on the debate as well. You'll see behind me, projected on the screen, a poll that is linked to a website that you can text an opinion to. There's a number up there, 22333. That number is the number to which you should direct a text. The text that you want to send to that number is a text that corresponds with whether you agree with, disagree with, or are uncertain about your position on the motion. And I should make clear, it looks like it's a bit cut off there. The top one is agree, 29471. The second one is disagree, 29474. And the bottom one is the one that you would want to text if you are unsure, 29503. So agree, disagree, unsure, in that order. Now is a good opportunity to take those cell phones out. And what a rarity to be in an auditorium like this where people encourage you to take your cell phones out. Take your cell phones out now. We're going to take a poll of the audience's attitude before the debate begins. We're going to then do the same thing once the debate is over, and we're going to compare the change in the audience's attitude over the course of the debate, based upon the arguments that the debaters have made. If, you're con if you've changed your mind, by all means let us know, and we'll award the win tonight to that team which does the most to change your opinion. While you're texting your opinion in, let me offer some thank yous for a number of individuals and organizations who made tonight's debate possible. First of all, to the University of Alaska, Anchorage, but particularly 
to the UAA Chancellor's Office, their Office of Administrative Services, and the College of Arts and Sciences. They've been terrific, terrific supporters of the Seawolf Debate Program, and we very much appreciate everything they did to make this evening possible. I'd also like to thank Siri Alaskan Tourism, who are providing our Oxford guests the opportunity to see some gray whales tomorrow. For their assistance in preparing for tonight's debate, I'd like to offer thanks to Richard Fromling and UAA music professor Laura Koenig for his terrific eye with graphic design and his endless patience with revisions, Greg Solomon, and most importantly, to KLEF 98.1 FM. Would you join me in thanking him particularly? I mentioned earlier that Rick Goodfellow approached me about a year ago with this idea, and perhaps even regardless of the success of this debate, the most wonderful thing about this opportunity to work with Rick has been getting to know him as a friend and as a mentor, and so we very much appreciate all of his support, and particularly the support of KLEF FM. I'd like to also thank all of you, and to encourage you to continue to support programs like ours, in addition to the Seawolf Debate Program's competitive team, we have a robust service agenda. We host tournaments for high school and middle school students. We coach those students to excellence. We help establish debating clubs in Anchorage and Alaska schools and cooperate with local partners to continue to improve the quality of discourse in Anchorage and in Alaska. Your continued support is very much appreciated. Without further ado then, I would like to call this house to order and call upon the first speaker from the proposition to offer arguments on behalf of the motion that stands in his name. Hear, hear. Now that's what I call an uphill struggle. <laughs> During our brief time in Alaska, we've been shown enormous generosity. From KLEFFM, who are sponsoring tonight's debate. From Steve, who worked tirelessly to bring us to the US and make our trip so enjoyable. And to all of you who've chosen to part with your hard-earned money in order to come and watch this debate tonight. But sometimes generosity can go too far. And we say that when governments choose to spend millions of dollars of taxpayers' money on a hobby and an interest which appeals to a comparatively small group of the population, that, in that generosity has gone too far. And that's why we're proud to support the motion that classical music deserves no funding beyond that which the market can sustain. Now, in opening this debate, first of all, I'd like to define a few of the terms of the motion. The basic proposition that Oxford wants to advance for you tonight is that not a cent of taxpayers' money should be spent on the performance or the production of classical music. When we're talking about classical music, obviously we're talking about something which is broad and often hard to define. But in general, we're talking about music where repertoire is written down in musical notation, adhering to long-established principles and conventions largely drawn from the Baroque, classical, and romantic periods. We're talking about things like the symphony, like the concert band, the opera, and recitals of concertos. And rather than seeing state funding, what we'd instead like to see is classical music being funded by the market, by which we mean ticket sales, private patronage, and grassroots-led funding. Now, in order to win this debate, we've got to do one of two things. Firstly, to show to you that it is principally wrong to use taxpayers' money to fund classical music. And second, to show that the creative landscape in general is damaged by classical music being funded. We're going to do both of those for you tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Now, for the rest of my speech, I'm going to advance two main arguments. Firstly, I'm going to talk to you about why classical music isn't a fair use of taxpayers' money. And secondly, I'm going to talk to you about how music is a matter of taste upon which the state should not seek to adjudicate. So first, in terms of why classical music isn't a fair use of taxpayers' money. Because when the state decides to take a portion of the hard-earned money that you make, we say the bar by which it has to surpass in order to justify spending that money is very high indeed. We say in general you should only fund things which are necessary, which are a public good, that cannot be provided by other means, and something that gives value for money. We don't think classical music funding meets any of these criteria. Firstly, we don't think it's necessary for a society to have publicly funded classical music. Secondly, we don't think that it is something that gives value for money. Classical music is incredibly expensive to, to uh, produce and to put on shows for. There are large fixed costs 
For orchestras, you're having to fund often up to 100 players, many of whom in the top flight can command up to six-figure salaries. In 2013, in the United Kingdom, over 50 million pounds was spent on the English National Opera, and it had less than one million attendees. Now, if you compare that to something, no thank you, like jazz, which in the same period only got about two million million pounds in funding, yet is similarly musically virtuous, uh, has similar musical virtues, and had just as many attendees, we say that you're simply not getting bang for your buck. And moreover, we don't think that you're providing a public good. We say instead what you're doing is providing something that appeals to a comparatively small proportion of the population. In 2013, only 2.8% 2 of record sales were comprised of classical music, and a small majority, minority of the population actually goes and attends concerts and performances. So instead what you're doing is spending a large amount funding something that is a fairly niche interest. And moreover, that niche is comprised of a portion of the population which is comparatively elite. When we look at the general audience profile of people who attend classical music concerts, they tend to be older, wealthier uh, than the average, and they are overwhelmingly white in lots of instances. A Princeton study showed that someone who had a high school education or lower was five times less likely to attend a classical music performance than someone who had been through graduate school. So essentially what we see when we're deciding to fund classical music is a transfer of wealth from the poor to the wealthy in order to fund the weekend hobbies of a cultural elite. We say it's simply unacceptable and it's time for government to get out of your record collections. Go ahead. Classical music, jazz, and pop all have something in common. They share a basis in the same principles of musical notation, which on your side of the house you don't want to teach people. How do you expect any of these forms of music to continue without this type of support? I mean, we're, we're, we're quite happy to create opportunities for people to learn music in school. We think that you're probably more likely to get them interested if you teach them music that they like and they know about. Teach them forms of music which appeal to them and their background, because it's simply the case that in lots of instances, classical music is just a story that young people and poorer people can't believe. From the obsession with manners and etiquette when you often go to see classical music performances, to even the, the origins from which classical music was born, adhering to elite tastes, and those elite tastes have been the custodians of classical music over a protracted period of time. For lots of people, they just don't believe in classical music, and they don't think it's for them. And we think that's entirely fine. And this leads me on to my second point about how music is a matter of taste. Because we're going to hear from the opposition how classical music is objectively fantastic and unique in its excellence. We say instead, though, that music is a matter of taste, and that all kinds of musical tastes are legitimate, and, gov and governments shouldn't seek to adjudicate on them. I prefer Drake to Debussy, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Being from Liverpool, I prefer the Beatles to Beethoven. And I'm not embarrassed to say I prefer Taylor Swift to Tchaikovsky. And that's fine. When governments are making decisions about how to spend money, they're making objective statements of worth and saying that classical music is exceptionally deserving of special reverence and attention beyond that which people would otherwise give to it. Now, firstly, that's patronizing. We say it's the attempt by an elite to force classical music down the ears of listeners, and we don't think that's acceptable. And secondly, we think that you're saying that classical music needs to be protected from the onslaught of popular music. Why should we defend something from something which is popular? There are lots of virtues to be found in popular music. The musicianship and craft of bands like the Arcade Fire and Muse. The lyrical dexterity of someone like Kanye West. And I've yet to hear an opera that can tell a story the same way the hobo Jim can. No, thank you. <laughs> now, Steve, that's pandering. Um, <laughs> but even if we, no, I believe it, it's awesome. Uh, but even if we step away from those sorts of examples, why is the sheer joy and emotion that the teenage girl who listens to One Direction, by the way, you're welcome, why is that any less valuable? Why is it less valuable when you're listening to Harry Styles and you feel like he's talking directly to me, I mean, the, the hypothetical person? That form of enjoyment is just as legitimate. The value of art comes from the meaning that the viewer or listener attaches to it and draws from it from their own emotional and intellectual experiences in connecting to that work. That is something that is personal, and that is not something that the state should attempt to decide upon. 
And moreover, it's something that it doesn't need to decide upon. In an age where we have access to things like Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, we say there's a free market that people can choose to buy into, and we don't think it should be the state making these sorts of decisions. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very proud to propose. Ladies and gentlemen, an honorable panel, Matt and I are absolutely willing to take Oxford on in their assertion that there is not anything unique or intrinsically valuable about classical music that warrants its preservation, because we think that there are things that are unique about classical music that warrants its preservation. What we're going to tell you on our side of the house is that classical music is a recognizable pillar of the art, something that individuals can easily, relatively access, we would tell you. We would like to see more of that. But we would secondarily tell you that classical music serves as a unique preservation of our shared history as human beings. We think that it serves as a frozen moment in time when we're able to look at written notes on a page and see as they're played and hear as they're played how the societies and the eras played out across history. But moreover, we would tell you that classical music's prominence is declining, and we find that difficult. We'd tell you that public funding outside of what the market provides is absolutely necessary and warranted to ensure that it exists into perpetuity. Note that all of the artists that were mentioned in the previous speech had to have some kind of training, right? For most of them, that was classical training. We think that the public funding of classical music in particular has benefits to the educational level as well as to allow individuals to actually experience it in the recital halls, in the Atwood Concert Hall. We think that that's important in getting those young people involved. Before I bring to you two basic arguments, first we're going to talk briefly about what classical music looks like in the United States, and then second, why you should care basically why there is a warrant for public funding of the arts, I want to make two key observations. First, we would tell you that classical music serves as a bellwether for other forms of art because of its visibility that I alluded to earlier. We would tell you that particularly these public performances and the decline that would result with a lack of public funding are a bellwether for other forms of art, be it poetry, be it paintings. We think that when we see declining funding from classical music, that indicates bad things in the future for other forms. But second, we would tell you that classical music is unique and that you must be present in order to experience it. There is something about being in a recital hall and hearing the rever reverberations of the notes throughout that cannot be duplicated by a pair of Beats headphones. We think that that's something unique that ought be preserved. So two broad arguments then. First, the health of classical music in the United States. We would tell you that up until the 1990s within the United States, we experienced a period of relative revival in terms of classical music. Uh, we had the American Symphonic League tells us that between the 1970s and the 1990s, uh, symphony orchestras were having longer seasons, engaging in more performances because there was a demand for them, right? We would tell you that a lot of symphony orchestras and other forms of classical light, art, like operas, tended to expand over this period of time. But, and incidentally, we would give you, uh, the New York Metropolitan Opera director, Peter Gelb, told the New York Times in 2008 that it, the New York Metropolitan Opera was so popular, they didn't actually have to engage in any advertising. People would just show up in the 1990s, particularly throughout the late 1990s, right? But unfortunately, that's not the case anymore, and that interest has declined, and we think that's for three broad reasons. First, there's declining attendance. As Matt alluded to, we would tell you that there are other ways for individuals to access entertainment, though we think classical music is distinct from entertainment. In the status quo, the New York Met struggles to get, to get individuals to come to their shows and has to engage in a robust campaign of advertising. But second, there's the rising costs. These are things like rising ticket prices for patrons, which means fewer people can access it. The gentrification that Matt tells you about, about functionally no people from the inner city or minorities being able to access classical music concerts because of the high cost is largely due to the market itself. So we're not sure why we would want to perpetuate that, not at this time. 
We would also tell you there are fixed costs, like paying the theaters, renting the hall, paying the artists who devote a significant portion of their time to practicing and learning this art. But finally, there are the things like bankruptcies and folding. The New York City Opera filed for bankruptcy in 2014 and is currently undergoing the bidding process now to see if someone else wants to take it over. Similarly, symphony orchestras in New York, New Mexico, Tennessee, Honolulu have all filed for Chapter 11 or Chapter 7 bankruptcy protection. We'd tell you that the market has sounded the death bells for classical music, and we want to reverse that trend. Go ahead. Okay. Even in Europe, where you have significantly higher levels of public funding, audiences are still declining. Why is it acceptable to use taxpayers' money to fund something that they're probably never going to attend? That actually brings me to my second point of constructive material I want to bring to you today, which is why you should care, right? Why should you care about classical music? We think that first, as I've already alluded to, classical training is the baseline, is indeed the basis of training for individuals who want to pursue music education. We're talking about voice. All of the instruments are based on a canon of written materials that we would classify as classical music. Moreover, we would tell you that classical concerts, and I alluded to this earlier, classical concerts are an opportunity to inspire young people, something that they can try to be like, right? We see young people wanting to be like sports stars they see on television, we think if we make these symphony orchestras, make these operas accessible, we show them what they could be into the future and incentivize them to pursue that. Also look to things like movie scores and studio recording artists. All of those individuals who we want to exist in the future are classically trained. We think we ought to preserve that art so that we can continue to have that enjoyment. But second, we would tell you that public funding of classical music provides things like infrastructure. We're talking about teachers and programs. Interestingly enough, No Child Left Behind and similar programs over the last several years have resulted in a loss of music education programs in 20% of, of communities in America with the lowest socioeconomic classes. These are the individuals the market is telling you shouldn't be able to access music. We find that problematic and with public funding, we tell you, we're able to reverse that trend because we're able to forward that funding, move that funding towards those programs and maintain them. Oh, no. Finally, no thank you, we would tell you that music is unique and distinct from entertainment as is indeed valuable. For this, we owe a lot to David H. Thomas, who is the principal clarinetist of the Columbus Symphony Orchestra. He gives four unique distinctions between classical music and entertainment that we think warrant public funding. The first, there is a unique rhythmic variety and complexity that exists within classical scores. There are dances, there are preludes and fugues, there are opera recitatives. A lot of variety exists within a single piece of music as well. It's not simply one time signature or one key signature. There's variety that doesn't exist within popular music. Second, tonality. Today's music is largely the same. Hilariously, Axis of Awesome, who are some parody artists, did a YouTube video a few years back based on uh, the chords one, five, four, and six, and went through like almost every single song over the last 20 years that has those four chords. Like there's no variety, right? <laughs> Classical music on the other, it was a great video. Classical music on the other hand has that variety. We think that's important important. Thirdly, there's a variety of emotion. If you listen to Before He Cheats by Kelly Clarkson, it's just really angry all the time, as opposed to a classical piece that has a variety of emotions throughout. Finally, there's the architectural and structural beauty of classical music. Counterpoint, theory, the ver reverberations of the sound throughout the hall. We would tell you that those overtones can only be experienced when you're actually there and not through a set of headphones. There's also the technical skill of the artist that exists. So what have we told you? We think that classical music serves as a bellwether for other forms of art, but we think it is a unique, of unique importance to our shared history as humans. That's why we're proud to oppose. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to talk about two things, but before I do that, I want to rebut some of the arguments that we've heard just now. Firstly, we were told that most of the artists mentioned in Matt's speech received their classical training, and without that, we would not have them. Taylor Swift, 
Drake, One Direction, I'm pretty sure they didn't receive classical training. I'm pretty sure their music would not be the same had they done so. And I think they didn't need classical musicians to be their role models. Taylor Swift just needed to break up with her boyfriend. <laughs> Secondly, there was no engagement on why you can use Matt's taxes to fund something he's not going to go see when he wants One Direction tickets. Second, thirdly, education. We never said that we were stopping it. And what happens when you translate the vast amount of infrastructure that you need to put on an opera to kids who want plastic trumpets to play at schools, which are underfunded? You said that we need to preserve a shared history, a shared history of being old, rich white men, because I'm pretty sure that that is not the way the United States of America are made up. Then you talked about rising costs and gentrification and this being the reason why people from urban areas don't go to the opera. They don't go to the opera because sitting in an enforced silence and sense of reverence is ridiculous to them because they want to feel something when they go to the music that they hear and they want something that means something to them. That there is no variety in the structure of music or in the emotion that Taylor Swift brings when she sings about whatever it is she sings about is frankly offensive to those artists. But it's also offensive to things like jazz and soul and hip hop because you try and tell me that that's not angry. No, thank you. You try and tell me that that doesn't mean something to people. You can just, you know, well, okay. No, thank you. I'm going to talk first, uh, like extending on what Matt talked about, about why classical music funding is an illegitimate attempt on behalf of the government to prescribe notions of higher culture. Because we think that imbued in the entire speech we've heard from opposition is the idea that classical music is a better form of culture, right? We think it's just not the government's place to say that kind of thing. We think that the government needs to facilitate the opportunity for culture because culture is important. But we don't think it needs to dictate the content of that culture, which is why funding should happen at only two moments in cultural movement. It should happen at the beginning when it needs to build a foundation that it does not yet have, or it should happen when that cultural activity is tied up with some other important social good, such as education. Classical music funding fits neither of those categories, ladies and gentlemen. So when we fund classical music in a democracy, what we're doing is letting the state indulge its own tastes in the same way that kings and popes did in the 14th century under the system of patronage. Ladies and gentlemen, it's very difficult to make a government accountable for the money it spends on classical music. Funding an orchestra is not like funding public goods like roads or hospitals. It is inevitably hard to judge those results, and it it ultimately comes down to, question, to a question of taste. But I think what's more interesting, right, is why opposition has this idea that classical music is a higher form of culture, why the state feels that it wants to impose this form of culture other than another. And I think it's why we fund classical music disproportionately is because we think there's a superiority about classical music and that's perpetuated by the funding because giving it more money than rap or hip hop or soul implies that it is superior. I'll take you in a second. But we think that that also implies a superiority about the people who listen to classical music. Old, rich, white men. So we think that that is a problem, yeah. We would tell you on our side of the house that rap and hip hop are already being supported by the market. We're not eliminating the market on our side of the house. We want to allow this important sense of shared history to continue to exist within that market as it's not being currently. Okay, but the reason that it is not in the market is because nobody's buying it, is because nobody's going to it, is because nobody wants to hear it. So what are you preserving? You're preserving your sense of elitism, and we don't think that that's something that the state should get to do, right? It's not about music, it's about elitism when you fund classical music in the way that it's being funded, right? We think that the idea that classical music is a mark of like musical sophistication because of its tonal variation and instrumentation, um, is patronizing to other forms of music that maybe don't use things in that way, but use it in a different way to maybe incur some more visceral reactions in the people that it's sung to. And we think it's not fair to say, oh, that's cute that you have rap and hip hop and soul, but like ultimately this is more important and this gets a ridiculously disproportionate amount of funding. Okay, but more importantly, that also grossly misunderstands what culture is and what it is for, right? Culture is not a measure of how much requisite knowledge
knowledge and training a person needs to engage with it. It's not a measure of how quiet you are when you sit in a concert hall. It's not a case of the older, the better. It's supposed to move us. It's supposed to help us express our humanity and to cultivate that humanity. We're supposed to change our worldview when we engage with art, the way we did when we wrote on the walls of caves and the way we do now when Matt listens to One Direction, right? It's supposed to help us live happily and more fully in the world. And I think bands like Rage Against the Machine help me do that way better than Bach ever has. And that is an important opinion because it's the opinion of more than 2% of the population. Ladies and gentlemen, at a time where cultural appropriation reflects the lack of diversity Americans are willing to expect, accept into the art that they consume, classical music tells a tale of wealthy white men, while jazz has inherited the songs of the freedom struggle and is arguably one of the most original art forms that America has produced. So let's fund that. Secondly, I want to talk about why, and now this is important too, because so far it sounds like we kind of hate classical music, but we don't. We think it's great, okay? In certain ways and under certain constructs. And we think that actually funding is holding classical music back from being something that can be important to culture, that can be important to more than 2% of the population, right? Because the institutions of classical music that exist now under funding are not the art form of classical music. They're not what classical music has to be about. So we think that in the absence of funding, we'd find that classical music would be forced to captivate a wider audience, to make market gain, and to have to engage people rather than relying on state funding. No thank you, because survival would finally depend on numbers rather than elitism. So I think it will do two things in response to a lack of funding. I think it will adapt the music that it self uses, right? So it will maybe change things, make it shorter, make it more interesting. You also have things like the Danish National Chamber Orchestra got its funding cut and started using dancers on stage. It started using rock and dance music in um, addition to classical music. And it's thriving, and people are paying to go and see it. And at the same time, the British chart compilers banned it from their classical chart because they said that it was pop music. It wasn't pop music, ladies and gentlemen. It was just popular. It was just that people wanted to see it and listen to it. And that's a great thing. You have the Vitamin String Quartet playing Radiohead. You have jazz, you know, coming from minimal resources and making something wonderful of itself. We think that with minimal resources and crowdfunding opportunities, classical music can do the same thing. Secondly, we think I'm so out of breath. Um, well, I don't usually sound this high pitched, I swear. Um, and the second thing that we think they'll do is make the music as it is more attractive. So you don't have to sit silently in the theater so that maybe we have orchestras in homes the way that they do in Boston with Group Muse. We think that you'll have crowdfunding that makes the conversation about classical music more accessible because you need to make it comprehensible to more people to get the money out of their pockets. Ladies and gentlemen, we beg to propose. Thank you. What is popular now has not always been popular. And it seems like a tautology for me to say that, but the reason I say so is because when we look to the market and the way that it supports popular forms of music, those popular forms of music, music converge on one ideal. That's the chord progression Jonathan told you about. They converge on appealing to their audience. And, and while appealing to an audience might be a good thing for popular music, the distinction that we would make between popular music and classical music is that classical isn't trying to be popular. The reason why classical music is so important is because it prevents itself, it chooses deliberately to stray away from that, or at least that's what the purest interpretation of classical music is. And before they can come up here and tell you again that rich white people are the only ones listening to classical music, I would just point to the fact that in Venezuela over 250,000 youth play in youth orchestras, and they're not old white men. Perhaps, the reason why classical music in the United States isn't so popular 
is because the lack of public funding, for example, from institutions like the NEA, which only contribute about 300 million US every year to the arts in general, not just speaking of like classical music, it's far, far less for classical music, perhaps it's because there isn't enough public funding. They make these arguments about how, well, people don't want to go to classical music, uh, uh, they don't want to go to performances, they don't want to go to all these other forms of, of uh, teaching activities, they don't want to learn how to play it, well, perhaps it's because it's not available to them, right? I mean, if you look to the classical music decline, the way that Jonathan told you about in the beginning of his speech, it's very clear that the presence of classical music is declining because it's been forced to rely on such on a market-based model. So if they tell you that they want the market to be used as a form uh, or a mechanism to allocate preferences, the question isn't whether or not classical music will become something that fades into obscurity. It's whether or not the very harms they tell you about classical music will get worse. The fact that it'll only be accessible to the rich people who live in New York who can go to the Met, who can go to the New York Symphony. It'll be only accessible to the very few who can access these types of resources okay, through that high ticket price. Go ahead. At the start of your speech, you told us that the virtue of classical music was that it doesn't care about trying to be popular. With an attitude like that, how are you ever going to engage people on a meaningful level outside of the very cliques that you're talking about now? By teaching people about it, right? I think one of the great things about classical music is it has kind of weathered the test of time, apart from this hyper-driven capitalist market society that we live in in the United States. Practically everywhere else in the world, classical music is thriving. Even your own example of, of England, or even the broader European Union as, as a whole, classical music is thriving, and it's because there's local investment into classical music. I'm, I'm not saying that we should copy Europe entirely, but I am saying that we do need to consider the value of certain art forms and why those art forms deserve a, a form of preservation. So first, let, let's talk about how we spend public funds, because it seems to be a bit of a controversy that the difference between us and Oxford, we have a very different view of where public money should go. The United States invests billions of dollars, uh, in taxpayer dollars, to shape certain institutions, ones that benefit society. They fund medical research, even though you know that medical research might only provide a cure for about five or 10 people who suffer from a very, very small type of illness that's deeply tragic to them, but for the broader rest of society, most people don't even know that exists. We fund research into space exploration, which many of us will never get to see. Never, many of us will never go to space, but we still value that as a culture, as a community, because we see that there's some sort of intellectual capital being created from that investment. So insofar as classical music and classical music education provides a degree of intellectual capital, we would tell you that it meets the criteria for when the public uh, money should go to it, right? It's not just about when it's just starting out or uh, when something else happens. I can't remember that second standard. I didn't bring it up. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. But surely culture is about more than intellectual capital. And surely we want culture to do things like move people to make them want to be a part of the world in which they live. And if you exclusively fund classical music at the expense of those art forms, then how can you defend that on the same level as saving someone from a deathly illness? Okay, but, but there's a false dichotomy here, right? Like, we're not just funding classical music to the point that every other form of music will die, right? We're totally supportive of having a plethora of musical options. In fact, we're so supportive, we want to ensure that everyone has an equal opportunity to access different forms of musical uh, options that might appeal to their tastes. The very same subjective argument about taste applies here. We would like everyone to have that opportunity to access and go to concerts and go to see the symphony if that is their subjective taste that they prefer. But right now they can't because these symphonies close because they're dependent on public funding. Okay. Second response, though, is, is this other idea, right? We need to decide whether or not, we, as a culture, we want to export certain things. So in the United States, this is particularly problematic. We export bombs, not Leonard Bernstein. It seems to me like the bigger issue here is what, as the United States, do we want to export to the rest of the world? Do we want to export a population that effectively listens to certain forms of music but doesn't appreciate the history of classical? Do we want to export to the rest of the world lots and lots of munitions, which are about 30, 40 times the arts budget that we have in the United States, just in terms of grants? What do we want our position in the world to be? And unfortunately, the answer being a market-driven capitalist society uh, from, from Oxford is rather puzzling because in and of itself, that doesn't necessarily produce culture. Okay, so, no thanks. Let's talk about old white men again. I mentioned earlier in my speech that 250,000 youth musicians in Venezuela participate in 100, over 100 uh, youth orchestras. This is really important because every year, or at least for the past two years, they've received 150 million US dollars 
from a US-led aid organization to fund those programs. So we put more money into classical music in Venezuela than we do into classical music here in the United States, and that's very deeply troubling. Perhaps our culture hasn't yet caught up to equality of opportunity for people to participate in classical music. When Jonathan tells you that 20% of a uh, re reduction in 20% of the low-income school district's ability to access classical music training programs and music education, it seems to me like this market-driven society isn't pushing us towards a brighter future where everyone has access to these resources, but rather pushing us further towards that stratification you tell us is bad. No thank you. I think it's really problematic, though, that, that your answer to this problem uh, of whether or not classical music should get funding is to tell us that the market should solve it. Here's the water. Just one moment. So, okay, let's, let's talk about audiences, right? In, in the 80s and the 90s, you saw a massive market push, right? Everyone wanted to sell as many tickets as they could, get everyone that they possibly could to the symphony. And, and this seemed good at first until they started building very, very, very large facilities, right? Facilities that require you to add another 10 violinists, another 10, 15 cellists. And, you know, it's, it's problematic that this happens because insofar as these scores were never really written for that many people, you, you start to distort the sound. You start to lose what makes that classical music great. But that's not the only circumstance this happens, right? Like, you have to look to the broader content of the pieces themselves. You have to appeal to either the masses or the donors on their side of the house. Whereas under a public funding model, you have to appeal to only the artist. The person who creates classical music, the person who performs classical music, is free to interpret it the way they wish. One particular example that stands out to me was that one symphony, it will remain nameless, decided to change Beethoven's 29th piano sonata just a little bit. They, they changed the ending. They used Liszt's ending instead because they thought it'd be more interesting. This is problematic for classical music because when it's forced to adapt to the market, it stops being classical and it starts being a form of popular music which doesn't preserve that intrinsic value, that intrinsic technique, that intrinsic expertise, and that intrinsic element of culture that Jonathan and I believe is so fundamentally important. So our four debaters have begun a conversation about what classical music should be and about how it should be supported. I'd like to now invite our judges to join in that conversation. We've given them basic instructions. We've asked them to think carefully about the arguments that they've heard and to prepare some questions that the debaters can respond to. So I'm going to call upon them now. If there's one of you that would like to volunteer to go first, there we go. And I what question burning, would you like to ask and to whom would you like to ask? to deliver the elderly white male perspective here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess my first question is to Oxford Matt, since I have two Matts in front of me. <laughs> um, your very beginning of your statement, you said that, um, that classical music ideally should exist in a climate of where ticket sales, private patronage, and grassroots fundraising would support rather than government money. Um, I don't know if you're aware that you're sitting in a country where that is what supports classical music. Um, there is no government funding of classical music, as the Anchorage team pointed out. Um, does that somewhat put a hole in your argument that we're basically, there seem to be two different arguments going on that, uh, that the, the thing you described as wanting to happen is in fact happening in this country? Yeah, and we think that should happen in Europe and should happen in the United Kingdom as well. Um, in a situation where you don't have public funding, you're putting pressure on classical musicians to change in order to continue to engage an audience. That's why we've seen the growth of group, group Muse uh, in Boston, which organizes uh, classical music performances in people's homes, uh, attempting to appeal to a younger audience in an atmosphere which is more laid back and which they can engage with. Uh, when you cut funding, you put the feet to the fire of classical musicians and you make them reach out and appeal to people in ways they hadn't done before. When you've got state funding, instead what you have to do is back winners because the state needs to see some sort of return on its investment so often makes the kind of safe bets, trotting out the same sorts of performances in the same sorts of venues in the same sort of way. And that's what's making it lose relevance to lots of people and contrary to what those guys are saying, you're, you are seeing classical music attendances dwindling in parts of Europe where you do have lots of funding. Um, 
we think that you can create a sense of urgency by removing public funding, which will cause us to change in ways to engage uh, new and diverse audiences. So by that argument, classical music in America is thriving because we have no public funding, so everybody's feet are being held to the fire, and therefore we are not suffering audience loss at all? Well, but we, we don't necessarily think on our side that if you are to have smaller audiences, that in, a, in and of itself is a bad thing. If people decide to choose to stop listening to classical music, that's something that we're okay with. But we think we are seeing more exciting forms of classical music emerging in the United States through things such as group news than you are in parts of Europe where you still do have that sort of funding. All right. Our next question. Zul. This is for Oxford. I guess one of the, the questions I have is, how would you define classical music? <laughs> um, so this was the first thing that we struggled with in prepping and the last thing that we struggled with and the thing that we struggled with in the middle. Because um, it's, just, it, it's obviously, in some senses, everything that uses notation and certain forms of instrumentation. And we kind of almost understood that. Um, but obviously at the beginning of the debate, Matt talked specifically about the Baroque, Romantic and Classical period. And I think that's because we chose to define it in that way because when you ask sort of the man on the street what he thinks classical music is, he's probably gonna go to Bach or Mozart or Beethoven. So we thought that that was a reasonable interpretation and we think that it stops being classical music when it, it moves further into innovation, and I think that particularly works considering opposition have decided to define classical music as something that hates change and being popular. Um, so... Uh, but I'll, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll follow up though, and I'll say, um, yeah. would you, how would you describe and why, why is it that most composers for movies use classical music to define their art form and they use these instruments? That's new music. Um, I think that that's probably the case because when you watch a movie you already have a narrative and you have a discussion that's accessible to people because they watch it and so they already know sort of how to feel and, and certain things to be thinking so that classical music then as a backdrop to something that people already understand probably works a lot better than sort of going to a symphony in isolation and not understanding, you know, the program. So basically you're saying classical music is humanity. No. I'm saying Taylor Swift is humanity. <laughs> and also, the last thing I want to know is, do you think that autocorrect is an art form? <laughs> I, I don't know where that's going, but no. Uh, that, because because the, the, I guess the question is, is that we're comparing basically fast food versus fine cuisine. Again, I just think defining something like jazz, which has come from the free freedom movement and like tries to be the song of a certain generation as fast food is offensive and misinformed. <laughs> You've got that vote. <laughs> Hobo Jim, I'm particularly interested in hearing what you'll bring to the table. Well, uh, there are two things first that are going to haunt me going back on my flight tonight. One is the old white man thing. <laughs> because I'm actually an old white man that listens to classical music. <laughs> so, and, and, and the other thing is this, uh, the six chords you're talking about, guys. George Jones talked about three chords and the truth. I'm still trying to figure out what other three chords you're talking about. <laughs> but, but... I've always been, I have two quick questions, but I've always been told there's a difference between music art and music business, and it's been a struggle in my life to learn, you know, to separate the two. I mean, I try to be as artistic as I can, but on the other hand, I, I make my living playing music. And so, uh, I've, and I've benefited from public radio playing my music. On the other hand, um, I've made, I've never taken grants and I've made my own living and struggled for that. So I would ask, um, if I can, really quick, I would ask, you guys, why should government fund classical music and not, at the same time, why wouldn't they fund folk music or country music? And if you do that, then they're just gonna have to fund everything any, anyone wants to do. And, and I, I feel that hunger, and I want, want you to address it, but I feel that if you're hungry for something, uh, it makes your music better because you have to get into the market and make people listen to you and it makes you strive. And that's you write new classical music instead of playing 100-year-old classical music. 
And then for you guys over there. Well, let's, oh, let's, let's, give, let's give Alaska a chance to answer. That's a great question, a complex question. But let's give them a I'm chance sorry. to ask, and then we'll come back and give you your shot at Oxford. All right, so I think one of the interesting things about classical music, and, and Jonathan and I tried to bring this out uh, as we gave our speeches, was that it really acts as a form of education in, in many ways, right? So in terms of classical music performance, I don't, I don't think that's the entirety of the debate. But, but even if it is, when you have people who play the symphony, when you have people who play chamber music, those individuals are nearly always involved in some form of role where they teach other individuals how to play music. And I think it's really important for no matter what other form of music you might play, whether or not you consider it classical or not, that you have that general exposure to that melodic nature of classical music, that you have that exposure to that basic, like really basic set of notation and, and chord structure that, I mean, you use three of them. Maybe there are six. I don't know. Jonathan could probably help us with that. Um, I, I don't think there are six. I think there are three. Four? Oh, there are four. Okay. <laughs> but, but, but nonetheless, the chords, just one? Anyway, you can tell that, that we're not the, the experts here. Uh, so, but I think it's really important though, when we're talking about chords, that, that is a music theory based element, right? We're, we're talking about something that comes directly out of music theory. And when you stop funding classical music productions, when you stop funding classical music education, you lose a lot of that, particularly in the, in the context of access. So I think when we're talking about, then the second thing I would say to that though, is if we're gonna talk about when government funds things more broadly, Government will fund everything, right? Most forms, particularly the forms that Oxford brought up, um, are not forms that really need that support from the government, right? They, they talked about music entertainment, right? In the context of the music business in the way that you, in the, the way that you framed it to us. But I think that if there are other forms, the government would probably subsidize those too, at least to the extent that it would subsidize any form of classical music. But I do think that classical music is unique in, insofar as it provides that educational backbone. All right. Thank you, and if, if I may. Oh, please, by all means. Um, and, and to you guys there, my question would be, should the government, um, are, are, are things, the only things that are worth protecting and preserving are, are, are those things that are only of commercial value? I mean, <laughs> if, because if that's true, then why do we have museums? You know, I would, uh, I'd, I'd like you to address that. Okay, um, so in general, we attempted to set out that the principles by which you should decide to fund something is something that is necessary, that provides a very broad public good, uh, and something that gives you value for money. Um, in terms of museums, you can take ticket entrance prices uh, from tourists, you can, you know, th those things are there and they last. Every time that you want to, and so that gives you value for money. Whereas every time that you want to put on a classical music performance uh, with an orchestra, you're having to fund you know, upwards of 100 people in order to make that happen. So in terms of the sort of longevity and, 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 the, ability and, the, and the bang for your buck, uh, I don't think it's really there. Um, and so I think in general what we'd like to see more with arts funding is funding something which gives everyone the ability to create and to engage themselves. And funding something that doesn't care about being popular, doesn't care about expanding, doesn't care about diversifying in the very words of opposition simply doesn't meet um, those criteria and doesn't surmount the bar that government should have to in order to decide how to spend your money. We have a couple of more minutes. I would invite any of the guest judges, Sewell or Anne. Sure, Anne, go ahead. I just, I guess where I was going with what I was saying is that we're using the examples of the extremes here. We're using symphonies, we're using the, the bloated concert halls. Um, and the fact is, is that um, I, I personally see music as education through chamber music and solo, things like this, that are chamber music, the whole idea of chamber, which is classical music. and. I'll answer the question, what is classical music? The classical music is the use of these instruments. I always found it very fascinating to see the pop groups like the Beatles, where they wanted to be more legit and or more um, better. Uh, <laughs> they, they incorporated a string quartet, or they incorporated these kinds of instruments in, their, in their, their groups. When I think of classical music, I don't think of Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms in particular. That's a, a time period. And so I, I typically like to use um, the examples of movies or video games. Most of the, the super popular video games and movies all use classical music and these instruments to sell their product. They also are, classical music is um, the use of instruments that are acoustic. They are human driven, they're not by electronics. That's why I brought up the auto 
auto-tuning because it's no longer human. That's why I use the word, you're kind of saying classical music is humanity. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a tough one because you you're keep using the, the, the grandest scheme of overhead for things that are productions that uh, do need funding and maybe it is for a particular type, but we've got to go into detail. And if you're going to continue to talk about these things, I would love for you to talk about more of the spectrum of, of things that are controllable. Chamber music is a room. It's called chamber music. Uh, you don't have to be in a 3,000 seat hall and there is very little overhead. And also, um, classical music is education. So you're basically pulling education if you don't have um, a government or people funding um, knowledge and the striving for more. So I just wanted to follow up by saying that because that's, uh, we, we keep going to the extremes here. I see, I see Jonathan yeah. holding the microphone. So I guess it's funny that you mentioned movies. I have, so, so my Spotify consists of like a bunch of popular music too, um, but then I have like nine or 10 also movie score playlists because they're super fascinating and fun to listen to. Um, and I think for us as debaters, it's really convenient, um, not necessarily convenient, but a lot easier for us to interact with each other when we have those, um, those bright lines in the debate um, because then that it provides us the opportunity to move towards the middle as the debate progresses and to begin to sort of consider some of those nuances that exist within classical music um, because I think that, I, I would agree, I think that classical music can be the use of those instruments, but I think that, you know, to a lot of people, even somebody like myself who wasn't really exposed to music until, or classical music functionally until I was about eight or nine, um, in a, you know, educational level, um, we sort of do compartmentalize classical music as those eras. That's how it seems to a lot of people. Um, and I think that speaks to sort of, in some instances, its accessibility. Um, I don't think that when people think of movie sc or movie scores necessarily, they think of it as classical music. They think of it as you know Hans Zimmer doing something totally awesome. Uh, <laughs> but when you, I think when you do concretize it and put it in that in that particular mindset, I think it does start to make people consider a little bit more deeply. Like, what do we mean when we're talking about classical music and how is the influence of what most people might consider classical music um, existed in society at large, particularly over the last 15 or 20 years? All right. Anne will give you the final question before we return the floor to the debaters. Go ahead. Gosh, I had two quick questions, one for each Feel team. Free. Can I do that? Absolutely. <laughs> um, for the Anchorage team, um, Jonathan said classical music is distinct from entertainment, and Matt said that um, classical music isn't trying to be popular. And um, I think that the great musicians of the classical tradition would have been astonished to learn this fact. Um, <laughs> there is a, a long tradition of this, this was entertaining, popular music, particularly if you're talking about something like Italian opera, which many people would still say is not art. Um, so, <laughs> How can, how can you possibly just, and I love Italian opera, but I might not say it's art either. Um, how, how would you justify an art form that doesn't care about reaching people, which is sort of the primary uh, goal of art, and if that doesn't constitute popularity, how do you define popularity? So I think there's a difference between an art form that's not trying to be popular and an art form that becomes popular over time and then, and then is forced to adapt itself to remain popular, right? So in terms of classical music, I think a lot of people look to classical and, and think that it should be something that changes with them, right? They, they want to go to the Disney concerts. They want to go to the 17th time the symphony is playing something from Beethoven, right? And, and that's not particularly bad per se, but there is a difference between the repetitive, repetitiveness and the move towards the middle that you get with classical music when it's forced to react in a market, as opposed to when it is something that is from the perspective of a person who is creative. I, I understand that in many ways, a lot of classical music was, was composed at the expense of people who had lots and lots of money back then, right? But I think that's really different insofar as the artist had a greater opportunity to create for the particular type of expression that they felt at that very moment. Whereas I think now, we don't necessarily have that particular opportunity, particularly in the context of new artists, right? Who would like to continue in the classical tradition. A, a market is a very daunting uh, opponent insofar as it really prevents them from doing things that are outside the norm. And I think that's one of the great things we've been able to establish here in the United States is our, our ability to do music research. 
which is d independent, typically, from like a lot of the classical music funding that we've talked about in this debate, but it enables us to get great research into some eclectic forms of what might constitute classical music that's different. So I think it is changing, but perhaps the audiences and the way that they interact with classical music doesn't necessarily want to change, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I would throw out there that I'm not sure that Bjork or Bob Dylan are really trying to be popular, <laughs> and, and Bjork is not really necessarily keeping in the box either. But <laughs> um, To the Oxford team, um, there were equivalents made between um, Tchaikovsky and Taylor Swift, and um, the point was raised, um, government needs to facilitate opportunity but not dictate the content of culture. Um, I would, I'm surprised to hear that any government dictates the content of culture with government funding. I have never heard of a government funder naming the content. Um, basically, art subsidies go to institutions, not music. In fact, to conflate the institution and the music is arguably an error because to keep an opera house alive is very different from telling the opera house what it needs to perform. And I think governments stay away from that. Um, so I'd like to hear your thoughts on the idea that somehow government is telling us we must hear Tchaikovsky, we must hear Beethoven, and that our, our content is being dictated through having this funding. Um, I think that what I meant when I said the point um, was that it's dictating the content of culture in the sense that given that funding for classical music is so disproportionate in terms of uh, funding it is so expensive, reaches so few people, and has such a poor return on investment that by choosing to take the pool of arts funding and put it into an opera house at all is sort of dictating the idea that we still need opera houses. So it's not that it sort of says you have to put on an Italian opera, which apparently would be awful. Um, <laughs> or very enjoyable. Um, but, um, Worse yet. Matt would probably enjoy it. <laughs> um, but... Um, so it's more just that by deciding that classical music needs to persist um, instead of these other forms of art that don't require as much money, that's kind of the dictation part. And that we think that you know opportunity is really important, but we think that classical music has had its opportunity in you know ample time. Um, and we also do think that you know without the funding, it's not that it will die. It just might have to change and maybe there won't be as many operas because they're so expensive, but that there will be new kinds of opera um, and, and things like that, I think. Um, just in addition, in terms of dictating, whilst that might not be true in the US, uh, one of the hallmarks of the new Labour governments in the UK uh, and the way it allocated arts funding was a very prescriptive social agenda uh, that the projects had to receive. Um, and even if you're not talking about that, I think there is always an, an aversion to the way uh, people are very risk averse in the way in which they spend state money. Um, and so I think you're more likely to see, and you, you are indeed more likely to see in the UK uh, and in Europe, um, people backing winners and going with the standard, uh, the standard operas or the standard concertos uh, because they know there's going to be maybe a dwindling audience but still an audience. Uh, and when you, you know, cut funding away, you encourage people to take more risks uh, in order to reach out uh, and, and, and to grow with a new and diverse audience. I'll leave my rebuttal because I'm not debating here. <laughs> <laughs> not debating, but certainly having to judge a debate. Let's thank our judges for their questions. <laughs> they still have an important job ahead of them, but fortunately they get a few more minutes to consider the arguments made by both teams. We're now going to transition to the summary and rebuttal portion of the debate, where each team will have one five-minute opportunity to present their best closing argument for their side of the motion. As is the tradition in academic debating, we're going to allow the opposition to go first so that the proposition, that side proposing that we should change the status quo, uh, has the option or has the opportunity to have the last word on the motion. So at this point, I would like to now invite back to the floor the University of Alaska representatives to close the case on behalf of the opposition. Here, here.
Hello. <laughs> if you, if, if, if you could leave your name with an usher, perhaps we could discuss a debate scholarship later. Um, I would ask you please to take your seat to provide the debaters an opportunity to close their arguments. Hello? Hello? <laughs> Thank you for your contribution. We're now going to return to the floor and allow the opposition to close their case in their five minute summary. Jonathan. in here, I can't like, actually see what's going on. So it's like, oh, let's... <laughs> In summary and crystallization, I want to bring to you two crystallizing points. First, does public funding for classical music entrench elitism? Because that argument has been bouncing around throughout this debate, and I want to crystallize those arguments for you. And second, is there a uniqueness about classical music that warrants public funding? We think that there absolutely is, and I will tell you what we've told you as why. So first, does public funding entrench elitism in classical music? We think that there unfortunately often is a characterization of classical music as something that's only enjoyed by old white people. It's unfortunate, but in many instances, that's the perception that exists. But what did Matt tell you, or what did my Matthew tell you? He told you, he told you that we want to provide individuals an equal opportunity to access the art and the music that makes them, that they enjoy, that makes them feel good. But we also told you that that very market that the government bench on Oxford supports, that market that exists is creating the stratification that is giving us the idea that classical music is something only accessible to old white people. It's the lack of funding to provide things like discounted tickets for individuals to attend concerts. It's the lack of public funding for music education programs to create an interest among students to attend these performances. We think that the market has contributed to this problem and we don't think it's a good thing. The philanthropy and those ticket prices are creating the problem that we want to solve. Ultimately, while we don't necessarily think that government may be mandating that a group of individuals, in this case, the House, to like something, we think that government's funding does serve as a normative force on things that ought to be valued. And we're okay with that on our side of the House. We're okay with saying that something that serves as the basis of our understanding of music that has grown and changed over the eons is something that is good. We're okay with that characterization. But then how should we diversify that audience? How should we change that perception that only individuals who are elite can access classical music? We need to dispel that myth. We need to dispel that rumor by providing individuals the opportunity to access it. Philanthropy is simply not enough. The donors are drying up. The ticket prices are going even higher, which means that the stratification we all think is bad is continuing to persist. We'd tell you that public funding can alleviate that on our side of the house, and that's why we support it. Because ultimately, and this brings me to the second point, we think that there is a uniqueness about classical music that warrants its preservation. We think it's things like the performances in and of themselves that you experience in a recital hall or even in a chamber when we're talking about chamber music, right? But we also think it's an appreciation of the technicality and the technique that is required to perfect that performance. It's the hours and hours that a musician spends behind closed doors learning that piece, perfecting that piece, so when they come to perform, we can all be wowed by their proficiency and emotive expression concerning that piece of music. But we would also tell you then that music is humanity. We think it's an integral part of our history as human beings and an integral part of how we'll move forward throughout history. What have we heard so far? We've heard that classical music might exist in some instances in a vacuum to some people, but it indeed influences and it indeed is a part of modern music today. We would tell you that there's a reason why individuals make a conscious choice to pursue a string quartet on their R&B hip hop track as opposed to something that's computer generated because it's authentic, because it means something to them and they want to be able to access it and have others experience it. We further think it pays homage to our history and how music has grown and changed over the years from being something that was liturgical to something that evolved into something that could be popular. We think that paying homage to that is a good thing. 
What did Oxford tell you at the start of this debate? They thought we should only provide public funding for things that are necessary and promote a public good and give value for the money. We think that it is necessary and indeed is a public good to preserve our shared history, to preserve what we would tell you is the inherent beauty of classical music, something that can be experienced in a performance. We also think it serves as a form of language preservation that might not necessarily be accessible to the whole, but is something that the whole can enjoy. That's why we preserve native languages. That's why we preserve the cultures of indigenous peoples. Not just because it's accessible by a single group, because it's something that can be enjoyed and recognized as good by an entire population. But finally, we would tell you that that value that class, that ought to come from government funding of a certain thing doesn't have to be monetary. We think it can be the intrinsic value. We think it can be non-concrete, as in music functioning as poetry in motion. It's something that has to be experienced in that recital hall. It has to be experienced in that room. We tell you the market isn't allowing that to happen, and we think that public funding alleviates that problem. We're proud to oppose. Profits at the door, the basis of business investment, instead of growing, are diminishing and evidently endangering the continuation of this noble entertainment. A quotation that could have been lifted from either of the Alaska speakers. In fact, from 1682 by Christoforo Ivanovich. People have often been concerned about the influx of market forces into classical music, yet still it finds ways to survive. We think by removing state funding, you push classical music in new and interesting directions in a way in which you will actually engage more people and achieve some of the very benefits that those guys want on their side of the house. We say that state funding is holding back classical music and our creative landscape from what it can be. In summarizing the case for Oxford, I'm going to talk to you about two things. The two burdens as I set out at the start of this debate. Firstly, to show you why uh, classical music is an unjust use of taxpayer money, and secondly, to talk to you about how removing funding would actually benefit the creative landscape. So first of all, in terms of public funding, I'd just like to point out once again, we've had very limited response to the notion that when you're taking money from people, you should be spending on things that are necessary and on things that appeal to everyone. To the contrary, we heard from Alaska that they don't care about popularity. Now, I'm sorry, but when you're taking taxpayers' money, when you're taking money from everyone in a society, I say you've got an obligation to reach out to as many of those people as possible. They tell you that what you need to do uh, in order to have classical music engagement is to actually be present. But when orchestras and when opera houses still create conditions that many people feel are anathema to them and their sense of who they are, it's simply not going far enough. We've spoken to you a lot about the audience profile of classical music, and obviously there are exceptions, but it's simply a fact that classical music audiences tend to be older, tend to be richer, and tend to be whiter than the median of a population. It's unacceptable to take the money of people who are never going to listen to classical music and force, it, force them to facilitate those sorts of people and their interests. These guys tell you that you can justify this because classical music is a unique pillar of the arts and that everything else sounds the same. You try telling me with a straight face that Billie Holiday sounds the same as Rage Against the Machine, which sounds the same as Kanye West, which sounds the same as Marvin Gaye, which sounds the same as Michael Jackson. Pop music is a veritable tapestry of different genres, of different ways of engaging with people and reaching out to people. We heard from one of the judges that it's, quite a, it's, a, it's a question of fast food versus fine cuisine. Well, you know what? I like McDonald's. Secondly, then... <laughs> Secondly, then, talking about the creative landscape. Because what we've seen is that unusual and trying circumstances spark creativity. We saw one tonight, spontaneous audience particip participatory improv opera. When you put people out of their comfort zone, you force them to adapt to get their message across. We say that will happen if you... Re <laughs> and we say that's what's going to happen if you remove funding from classical music. We heard from the opposition that the reason they like classical music is because it's a frozen moment in time. We think there's a risk to fossilizing classical music because that's what happens when you have state funding. You're forced to conform to narrow political agendas. You're forced to trot out the classics in order to guarantee at least some return 
on investments. And you don't create the conditions where people are forced to improvise, where people are forced to diversify, to reach out to and engage with new people. We've heard the examples of films, of film scores and video game scores. Those are ways that you can reach out to and engage new people. Things like Group Muse in Boston organizing new and innovative ways of engaging a broad array of people. If you guys want to reach out to people, we say that actually counterintuitively, removing state funding is a good way in which you can create the conditions in which that is more likely to happen. Secondly, in terms of the creative landscape, these guys say that you need to have the educational benefits of classical music in order to appreciate and enjoy a whole of a variety of different types of musical tradition. Firstly, if we pull public funding, it's not the case that classical music is going to disappear. We're not going to suddenly go on Spotify or iTunes and wipe everything away to prevent people from ever accessing and engaging with those forms. But if it is the case that you do have to be present in order to fully experience the emotional effect of classical music, we say you're more likely to have that on our side of the house when you create the conditions when people are forced to reach out to more people in ways in which they otherwise wouldn't have done. Ladies and gentlemen, at the end of this debate, you've got a choice. You've got a choice between a side who wants to allow people to make their own cultural decisions and not have a narrow political elite enforcing, once again, the narrow views of a narrow group of people, and it's actually a side which wants to force culture to change, to diversify, and to reach out to new and exciting audiences. I hope you make the right decision and vote with Oxford. Thank you. The right decision could mean so many things to me. Before we return to our guest judge, them to articulate their decision and their position on the motion tonight based upon the arguments they've heard, we're going to reopen our poll for the evening, our post-debate poll. You'll notice that this one, unlike the pre-debate poll, will not update as you text your opinions in. We're going to reveal the results of the audience's decision once we have a chance to hear from our guest judges. But it's going to work if you will please text your opinion to the number 22333, and one of those three codes, I see the debaters are quickly doing it as well. Um, text your opinion based upon one of those codes to that number, and your vote will be recorded. We'll use that as the basis for awarding the win in tonight's debate. But we first want to hear from our guest judges. Zul, could I impose upon you to reveal your decision first, and then explain to us why you reached that decision? I asked the question or proposed the, 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 the topic of what is classical music. I don't think of classical music as you projected it, uh, Oxford. Um, and this is why the, the, the topic was sent that way. Um, when I think of classical music, I think of, of humanity. I actually think of what I have witnessed firsthand outside the concert hall, that the funding for the, the visit of the artists that come to a city to play the concert but then go into the community, to the people who can't afford it, to, to bring music to hospitals, hospices, um, the Highland Prison, to see a baby and an infant uh, intensive care open its eyes for the first time when they hear an acoustic instrument like a cello or a violin, and you see that the oxygen rises and the heart rate goes down, the power of music, playing music that has resonated through the ages, which actually does define a culture. Uh, we. I see funding uh, as necessary because it's taking care of a culture. It's taking care of our history. It's, it's giving confidence for expression. It's giving a confidence for a future of expression. Um, so uh, my decision, uh, and even though both sides were, were very, very um, intense, um, is for UAA because of the, the, the things that one can't really put their finger on in describing what classical music represents and that classical music is not necessarily the grand opera house or the symphonies. It's actually bringing people together to express themselves, whether it be in youth symphonies, uh, families. Um, again, it's, it's so much greater than, so funding actually takes care of uh, us as human beings. So my vote is for UAA. Since you've got the microphone in your hand, you look ready to go, Hobo Jim. Which side would you call it for? You know, first off, I want to thank both you debating teams. You, you young folks are so brilliant, and um, 
I'm, and I'm, I really have to say, this is really hard for me because um, you both, you, both sides argued so well. And I'm so proud to have Alaskans that are growing up so brilliant and doing, <laughs> doing so great. I really am. But with that being said, and this is probably the hardest thing I've, I've ever done, I, I came here to say that I would, I, I had no preconceived notions about this thing and I, I wanted to be swayed. And, and so I, I'm doing this on, on the merit of the debate. And I would have to say that I am totally convinced in free market and, um, and, and in the hunger, and the inter most interesting thing that caught me is when I was saying that hunger, I think, makes your art better, that you can, if, if your buildings are too, too large for your art, downsize your buildings until you can build up your, your crowd like anyone else has to in a free market. And, but your argument when you said, when you were talking about video games being the new you know, that it's in all the video games and things. That's a perfect example, as you pointed out, of how classical music can expand in the free market. And so Oxford, um, welcome to Alaska, I give you <laughs> No pressure, Anne, but it is one and one, so the deciding <laughs> vote on our guest panel goes to you. Well, I feel like I heard two slightly different debates because I heard two teams arguing to change the status quo. I heard a team coming from a country where there is government funding saying there shouldn't be, and I heard a team coming from a country where there is no government funding saying there should be. So we have a grass is always greener debate which plays out in our field constantly and all the time. Um, I, uh, purely on the strength of the arguments, obviously I'm all for classical music, um, and I would pick a lot of holes in Oxford's argument, particularly, Matt, the idea that funding makes people lazier. I lived in Germany for 12 years and where state funding is massive for opera, and they did all kinds of really bizarre and sometimes terrible things that got <laughs> half the house filled because they didn't have to care if they filled the house or not. Um, and English National Opera, which you mentioned, is used as a laboratory by the Metropolitan Opera to try out stuff that they then bring over because English National Opera can try out stuff. Um, that's the debate I didn't, didn't want to give. But, uh, but purely on the, the rhetoric, I think that Alaska, you guys brought up a lot of um, laudable but oft-worn points about classical music that um, it would be great if they were true. It would be great if classical music were really better than all other forms of music and were uniquely privileged. And I spent my life in the classical music field, but I just don't believe it is. Um, in, in any case, I have to give the win purely on rhetoric and uh, impassioned to Oxford. So the debate coach, the Alaskan debate coach in me, hopes that you'll rectify this situation. <laughs> Could we please now return to our consideration of the audience's vote by looking at the pre-debate results? By way of reminder, before the debate began, 27% of you believed that classical music deserves no support beyond that which the market will provide. 60% of you opposed that motion, and 13% of you chose to reserve your judgment until you'd heard the arguments. If we could now take a look at our post-debate poll. Ah. So we have a move from 27% to 43%. More people now believe that classical music does not deserve support. Fewer people believe that classical music does deserve support. Clearly, this win goes to Oxford. Congratulations. <laughs> I often say at the end of these debates that a good debate is not the end of a conversation, but the beginning of a conversation. And I think that's particularly poignant as we look at current events as they're unfolding uh, in Baltimore, as that's going on. Um, a very impassioned mu classical music fan called me this afternoon and said, hey, have you seen this article where the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra chose to play a free concert? Um, in response to the violence that has been occurring in Baltimore in the past few days. Uh, I had a chance then to do some research on that and found 
that in their press release announcing their free concert, they expressed a sentiment from Leonard Bernstein that I think really captures the sentiment of this debate. Clearly, all of the people on this stage care deeply about music and care passionately about music. Regardless of how we choose to fund it, it's obvious that it is an important part of who we are. The quotation from Leonard Bernstein that was offered in the, the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra's press release goes like this. This will be our reply to violence to make more music intensely, more beautifully, and more devotedly than ever before. And I would challenge you as you leave tonight to find those opportunities not only to make music, but to engage one another in all of those wonderful ways. Thank you all so much to our guest judges, to our team from Oxford, to our Alaskan debaters, and to all of you. Continue the conversation. Thank you.